Welcome to the Gregarious Mammal Podcast. This is Chris. And this is Kate. And how is everybody on this fine, fine time of day? How are you, Kate? Oh, pretty good. It's um hard to tell what the weather's going to be like here in Berlin today. It looks like we might get a little bit of sun, which would be very nice. I can already see sun, so I think you're right. And it's been a busy few weeks, hasn't it, Kate? We're actually going to have a bit of a special covering some events we've been to. Yes, we have been to many events and, um, you know, it's easy to question the validity of tech events when we have a sheer scale of conferences, exhibitions, trade shows, um, everything, summits and congresses and all those sorts of things but um yeah this last month has been spectacularly busy and um what we're going to do is show you talk about some of the most interesting things we've come across so let's start at the beginning and the beginning was the momentous yearly epic that is IFA um IFA if you don't know firstly stands for International Funkausstellung uh, or literally the international network um, show. Funk is kind of the word that Germans use uh, not for music, but Radios. for broadcast, radio, TV, etc., yeah, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, but basically you can think of it as the CES for Europe. Uh, it's a huge event. Actually, I saw some numbers uh, recently. Um, I think there was nearly a quarter of a million visitors um, over nearly a week. Uh, they had lots of side events this year. So it's, it's pretty big, but it is a lot of, well, <laughs> it's, you know, we go there to focus on particular things, but there are also, is also a significant portion of the exhi- exhibition space that's dedicated to ovens, food processors, uh, phone vacuum accessories, cleaners. vacuum cleaners. Yeah. I, I think it's also worth noting for the listeners that unlike going to something like maybe Mobile World Congress or CES where a big chunk of it is it's a trade show, this is also true, but it's um, an event where the tickets are kept very low in terms mm. of price. So families will come and spend the day there, you know, come and have some breakfast and see some um, <laughs> VR and, you know, get to, I don't know, play with some games or play with a, a blender or something. Play with know. a blender. How do you play with a blender? <laughs> I don't know. Put in but little maybe, Johnny in there. Maybe um, they have a lot of cooking demonstrations. So yeah. maybe, you know, here's our latest toaster. Look, it makes toast. Some of that sort of stuff perhaps. It makes toast. Oh, my God. Okay. I know. What were your highlights of Aoife, Kate? Um, if you had any. I think um, – Mille, which is a um, German company, had a very interesting oven. Uh, and when you say oven, you kind of go, yeah, that's a bit of a yawn. But I think what what interested me about it is that it shows that we've got these very traditional con- conventional companies. And this was something that I really saw as a trend throughout the, the event. Our, you know, the, the Panasonics and the Samsungs and all these kind of um, – Siemens and Bosch, companies that you think of as being maybe a bit old and traditional, maybe, you know, both doing consumer products and industrial space, are actually trying um, to keep up and to, to lead a lot of the innovation because they've got, I guess, the money that you may not get in in the initial startup scene. And um, what was crazy about this oven is it basically um, was considered – it was called the Dialogue Oven um, – and it was basically the the background or the the result of six years of, of research where they looked at things like medical heating and space science and things like that. And its aim was to, as was what I guess you'd call traditional um, precision cooking. So the demonstration that they gave was that you could cook a fish embedded in a a block of ice. So if you imagine a big ice block with a, a, a fish in it, <laughs> without that you could cook that without the ice melting or that you could have a tray of dif- different ingredients like maybe a leg of lamb, say, and some potatoes and they would enter the oven at the same time. But they would all cook, you know, as needed precisely depending on the individual ingredients. And um, I guess the way they they kind of say they do they achieve this is basically through using electromagnetic waves um, in a specific frequency range. 
Um, and this is distributed in the oven through high performance sensors. So it's also that sort of molecular cooking. It's an interesting use of sensor technology. Um, it shows that whilst, you know, this kind of stuff is at the higher end, you know, you're looking at 9,000 plus euros for an oven. It's a technology that when you think of companies that first started out, like maybe Dyson with their, their vacuum cleaners or um, the iRobot, was it iRobot? Robo, the, the vacuum cleaners. Um, what were they called, Chris? The robot vacuum cleaners? There's one called Roomba, but I think there's one called Ira. I don't know. You're right. There's lots Roomba. of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, Incidentally, if you read a, a comic called D4VE, a Roomba becomes president of the robot kind. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, look, it's, it's one example where, you know, I think it shows, it shows some sort of interesting innovations. Um, other highlights, robots. Mm. There were lots of robots and um, the biggest kind of trend with these was really trying to get robots in the home, either in an educational provider kind of way where they would help kids with learning different skills. Um, they would be utilised in the home as kind of a an iPad meets Alexa, a lot of voice activation. That technology. moves around and blinks at you. <laughs> yeah, and um, I mean what really got me about the robots, and I, you know, we'll link to some, some pictures and stuff, was that the um, prices were very cheap. Mm. The, the prices Relatively have really speaking. dropped in yeah. the last five years. When you consider that, you know, we, we talked to startups that were selling kids' toys that effectively were, you know, <laughs> a piece of wood that had eyes that could blink through an, um, through being controlled by an app from the parents. So the idea was to get, you know, get little Johnny away from the, um, the iPad so we'll give them this wooden toy that blinks. Um, that was, you know, 150, 200 euros. And you could buy one of these pretty functional robots with facial recognition and the ability to speak languages and sing and dance and do various tasks for about 800. Yeah. So... I follow your trends a little bit. I, I didn't really spend too much time with the, the ovens and things like that. Yeah. But definitely robots. Um, there's a lot that looks similar. There's yeah. some that look downright creepy. Um, I don't really know how popular they're going to be outside of Asia for a while yet. But I think the interesting thing for me was that with a lot of these robots, they're now the manufacturers are introducing like app stores or a way for developers to be able to make applications for them which is a smart move mm. uh, it sort of distributes the 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 brain trust as it were and also um this fits very nicely into one of the other major trends which was mostly alexa everywhere mm -hmm. uh, an element of google assistant but mostly alexa uh, either embedded in devices itself or embedded in a device via uh, a connection from one of amazon's bits of hardware um, it also showed that these voice assistants are not perfect right now. Things like demonstrating them in a noisy environment is quite hard. Mm. Things like demonstrating them in mixed language environments is quite hard. We saw a poor guy from Taiwan who couldn't demonstrate his application <laughs> because when you plugged the Alexa in, it defaulted to German. <laughs> and yeah, he couldn't change it. So, you know, it's not a perfect world yet, but uh, it's interesting. Um, and we actually have had an echo in the house for quite yeah. a while that we haven't really done much with and we've started experimenting with a little bit. So watch this. Well, don't watch this space. Listen to this Listen space. Listen to us when we tell you a bit more yeah. about what happens there. <laughs> I think the other thing for me was um, VR has sort of become mainstream. You still have a lot of the high-end devices, but there was a lot of mid-range devices. Mm -hmm. Devices like from Royal. I'm not sure how you pronounce that which were not really true VR devices. They were more for watching movies and playing normal games. But again, they were affordable. They're less um, obstructive. They, they look kind of more acceptable. Mm. And why, um, why do you think the price points have dropped there? Is it that there's more people because, making yeah, it, them? It's not as, no, it's not as advanced. This isn't, yeah. this isn't an Oculus. This is basically a TV in front of your eyes. It's, right. it's, it's not advanced technology. But that's okay because that's... To make the um, the higher end decrease in price and become more acceptable, mm -hmm. the lower end starts and then the prices meet in the middle somewhere. So, uh, And also I found fascinating this company called Merge who had these goggles that 
were kind of meant for children that reminded me of the Viewmaster 3D, if anyone's old <laughs> enough to remember that. And they also had this AR cube that looked like something from Hellraiser. And I don't know if they realised that. It kind of freaked me out. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they just assumed anyone in their age range didn't know what Hellraiser was. So, <laughs> yeah, It's um, funny, you know, because yeah. I... Um, I, I talk to people so much about the industrial applications, a lot mm. of this tech. I always forget that the the gaming was a, originally mm. the conduit mm. where it all exactly. started. Yeah. And actually on the subject of play, I think our other area of uh, where we saw some good innovation was the sort of smart toys mm. and up. Um, some of the robots obviously fit into this, but I think we both really, really loved a product that we're hoping to do a bit more. Um, writing on in the future called Bear Conductive. It was a conductive paint that mm. connects to a small touch board that you can then connect to a Raspberry Pi. And you can basically do all sorts of things with it. It pretty much replaces um, a circuit board in some respects. You can make musical instruments, alarms, educational toys. Actually, when you start thinking about it, the applications are quite wide and it was really fascinating just yeah, how simple it was. I think how what well appealed worked. to me about it was that it made the... Um, access to learning very accessible because mm. the way they kind of market it is, you know, you've got enough to, to build three different things effectively. Mm. Um, we've got, here's one you can copy from us so you can learn the skill of, you know, where to place things and how it all works. And then we've given you some strategies so you can create your own ideas. Mm. So I think that's mm. quite a nice mm. way to get people um, mm. engaged with a new product. And this also fit into one of my other highlights, the Bixi. For a similar reason, mm. it was a programmable button, which there was a lot of those at EFA actually. But the interesting thing with Bixi is it instead of being four buttons or one button or something like that, it's actually a, a gesture detector and you can define your own gestures. Uh, this also starts to open up a lot of potential for uh, in cars, in industrial contexts, in a lot of places. And actually we spoke mm. to the founder of the company and he mentioned that Yes, people are buying them. They're 99 euros each, so not too expensive. But actually most of his business is currently in talking to car companies. Yeah, they like actually that. crowdfunded last year, I think mm, it was. Mm, um, mm. But, yeah, I mean the gesture control and the gesture recognition technology is something that I've, re I've seen a lot of in the last year. I think it's um, becoming more mainstream into products and things. Well, again, and it started in gaming, actually. It yeah, there you go. As well. Yeah, yeah. Any other highlights from EFA for UK or any other general closing feelings on the whole event? Um, not so much. I guess my closing feeling was that this is our second or third year mm. and I felt like this has actually been common with a lot of events I've been to in Berlin this year, that uh, it felt more international. It felt yeah. less German and more international. Um, international exhibitors, an international feeling, international attendees – they had a lot more side events this year. The Actually, startup area was bigger. They did a partnership with TEDx. Like it was, it felt much more like an international event as opposed to just a kind of slightly, um, slightly ridiculous trade fair. I mean, there was still a lot of that, of course, with all the toasters and things like that. But generally, it felt a lot more like, yes, we want to make IFA. A respected event, not just kind of a poor person's CES or something. Yeah, like that. I mean yeah. that's actually a, a, a point I should make. I mm. wrote an article last year after Eva, being mm. um, quite horrified with the level of booth babes where women mm. are um, employed to staff a booth, and their role there is not they're not there because of their mm. technical skills, but because they're wearing a short skirt or something mm. similar, and. Um, Really being just quite shocked. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> and um, It was a bit better this year. There it was, was much little, better. I, did, I and, and bear in mind, last year I didn't go looking for it. Mm. There was just so much of it. You know, I was just really shocked. But this year I didn't really see that so much. I saw I a lot a bit, more kind uh, of... I actually also think it might have dress. sadly been a little bit because we didn't spend so much time in those areas as well. But, possibly. Yeah, quite yeah. possibly. But uh, I remember one company that we particularly called out last year the dress of their female staff members was much more restrained this That's year right. so at least they <laughs> I know. I'll, this I'll, particular I'll put company a little link to that article because it does um yeah. challenge some of the issues around this this whole discourse 
And so if you want to read more, I wrote an article for D-Zone with my wrap-up, and I think you've written sort of a handful of articles, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, I've got, I've got a few bits and pieces and a few bits coming out still. Okay. Cool. Let's move on. So the day after we went to IFA was an event that we were supposed to both attend, but you ended up being a little sick, which was mostly mm. due to me being sick before. <laughs> it was a French versus German IoT battle. Um and yeah, this was sort of a strange event. It was very hospitable, lots of free drinks and things like that. And um, I must admit, I found some of the selection of contenders a little, eh. uh, and actually the winner ended up being an application that, as far as I could tell, had absolutely nothing to do with IoT. So that was a little... How does that work? <laughs> I have no idea, because when it comes to people just voting, it was just picked on who was who shouted the loudest. So mm. I found it was a fun evening, but I found the whole competition a bit, uh, a bit um, extraneous and a bit, it didn't really seem very legitimate, but that was, I don't think that was the point really, but it was fun. And actually my highlight would be again, even though I liked it ever so loosely connected to IOT, uh, this is Jovo. And I actually encountered the guy who, is behind Jovo three times in that week. So oh, really? he, he was certainly busy. And Jovo is a platform that lets you build Alexa skills and Google Actions from one platform. So if anyone remembers the days of kind of cross-platform mobile development using things like uh, Sencha and um, PhoneGap, then this is almost like that for uh, voice assistants. And mm -hmm. I haven't given it a, a try yet, but it seemed to me like something that if they have done a good job and if people use it, that will save a lot of developers a lot of time. Oh, that's and, good. Uh, that really sounds pretty good. So that was one of my highlights. So next in that week, we went to something a little different. I, I like to think that a lot of these events were all happening in the same week because of IFA, but I'm not 100% sure if that's true. Mm. It could have just been coincidence. But interestingly, the next event we went to was actually an Armenian startup night. And I must admit, I'm still not even entirely clear where Armenia is. I've got a rough idea. And they didn't really help in the presentation. <laughs> they didn't tell us in any more detail. Um, but it was actually really interesting. I think for me, it represented again that small countries are often some of the most innovative. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a nice event. It was a slick event. Most of the companies there were very good. I mean, I'm going to flip through the handbook now and read out sure. a couple of the ideas. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one thing it did show was the value of free education, um, you know, Armenia is a place where people are highly educated, like a lot of the Eastern European countries now. Um, they have a skilled workforce. So people are coming in with good technical skills to, um, you know, start startups as opposed to maybe coming in with an MBA or something like that. So one of the companies that appealed to us was a company with a name that I cannot fathom how to pronounce, Groff. Yeah, Groff I'm actually F. interviewing them on Friday. <laughs> so maybe can you explain a bit what they do? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, and I must admit, even their presentation video didn't really explain it in any more detail. It's, but um, it's, it's for, look, from memory, I mean, and apologies, listeners, it was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was basically an industrial IoT application, um, a, new, a new way of being able to um, – use sensor technology mm. to be able to help um, in, in enterprise. And, you know, it's it's one of those sort of areas where it's not something that and, until I until I have spent some time reading over it, I'll be very au okay with, but I can see it's the It's still a little unclear, but I think the impression I get is it's a sensor and database in one. Yeah. So for prototyping, it's a lot faster than using a cloud-based solution i think that's the impression i get it's always amazing how you can sometimes see a company and think these guys look really interesting without completely understanding what they yeah, do yeah yeah slightly embarrassing we don't I, do this on a regular basis of talk yeah UK. I, no, no. I think it's also we we do get a bit excited when we see people working in the hardware space With looking circuit at, board yeah you know <laughs> because it is something that you do sometimes yeah. miss from the tech scene here in Berlin because there's a lot of people doing more mm. your app-based or your, your fintech and stuff like that. And another one was Inaptics. Uh, I, they, there are some competitors in this space, but it's basically 
a platform that lets you did uh, I'm trying to remember the web company a uh, hot hot egg or something crazy like that <laughs> or crazy egg or something like that but for websites but it lets you do kind of um, heat map detection of where people touch in your mobile application so you can see which interface elements are being used which aren't being used and I mean this is somewhat important in mobile applications because screen space is mm. of course very limited so if you can see exactly what people are and aren't using it really helps you optimize it um, and it's it's also hard because it needs to be data efficient and battery efficient and etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think I've heard of them before I feel like I remember this company from a previous event somewhere so they're doing reasonably well Next um, was a, a an activity and weight tracker called Embry. But the interesting one with this, and it took a while to figure this out because it's so subtle that you barely noticed. Instead of it being like a Fitbit-style watch or something like that, it's actually a tiny, almost like toe ring, mm. um, which sort of makes sense, actually. That if you're going to track steps, then tracking feet seems to be a good idea, really. Yeah, they were pretty early, though. They mm. were barely at the prototype stage. When I, I spoke to them, and the, you know they they've got a bit they got a bit to go yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, well, I, yeah, that's not to say that people don't have good ideas, even if they. Oh no, 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 not, not at all. <laughs> but it's just you know we we it's it's a harder idea to assess until you know um, if they've you know once they've done trials with people and things mm. like that. Um, another one. This is a little hard to explain. Um, X Cloud Networks. We actually met them again at Startup Night, and basically they are a way of building and maintaining cloud infrastructures. So there's kind of, if anyone who's ever been in the DevOps space is kind of, they're usually called software defined networks. So it's like you define a network with software, and it doesn't really matter to you too much where where things are your your kind of network could be a server in a google data center in california and it could also be a server in an amazon data center in amsterdam and it doesn't really matter you just kind of define the networks the way you want it's quite complex stuff and there's not that many competitors in this space their biggest is probably someone like cisco but it's still relatively early days for cisco in this space so it's it's quite complex stuff it was quite cool software um, yeah, if that interests you, then have a look. XCloud Networks. Uh, the kind of name is somewhat generic, although it kind of makes sense. But uh, it was interesting, actually. Uh, hmm. And they already had clients who they said to me had saved thousands of dollars and person hours in using something like this. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, interesting. Um, next up. Next up, actually, this was interesting. Feeding back to the what you said earlier about the kind of Eastern Europe ex-USSR education. Mm. So this is one application that was a chess training application. Oh, yeah. Now, this in itself is not, you know, chess training. There's plenty of chess apps. But the interesting thing that why this relates to Armenia Mm. was that apparently they have per head of population the most chess masters in the world and every child is taught chess and they put down a lot of their success in technical expertise down to this. So I found this kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's um, an interesting way of teaching a different way, of, a, a different skill set and a way of thinking, I guess. I mean, I've never learned chess. Well, I mean, I think most people know how to play chess, but then there's playing chess and being good at chess, I suppose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and... One more here. This is actually, I mean, I'm not really into these sorts of applications. This was Pixomatic. It's uh, oh, yeah. uh, uh, iOS or Android as well. I'm not 100% sure. But a mobile application for image editing. But I think the thing I find interesting with this is despite the uh, declining kind of ease of getting revenue from mobile applications, there's still plenty of people and companies who do and a lot of them tend to revolve around photos actually mm. i also interviewed a guy in israel who just makes two photo apps and makes a living from that and this is a company that makes a living from their application so it's still possible i guess it's the kind of thing i found most interesting next uh, i think you might be interviewing these as well kate uh, triple e no mm. 
No, you're not interviewing them. They describe themselves as Triple E is going to be the Instagram of augmented reality, which is a bold and possibly slightly demeaning claim to their effort. But um, were, were they the ones you could edit your photos on your phone as you took them? No, that was actually the previous one we ah. spoke about. This was sort of the ability to easily make and share augmented reality elements, I guess. Right. Which, yeah, I'm not sure if Instagram is quite – because obviously with Instagram you're just taking photos. With augmented reality you're sort of still creating. But I guess, yeah, I suppose it's it's taking it out of the domain of complex tools like Unity and making it into something anybody could use, um, which I guess is the next logical step for, for something like augmented reality. So yeah, that was a little roundup of uh, some of the companies from Armenia. I'm sure there's a lot more. But um, yeah, what did you think, Kate? What was your general impression of the Armenian startup scene? Obviously, we would love to go and visit, <laughs> hint, hint, but uh, yeah. Yeah, look, it was interesting. I mean, I, I think it showed people that we're looking at products that in general tried to solve a problem rather than just make money per, per se, I guess. Um, it women were definitely underrepresented in in the um, contingent that came over. However, um, the organisers did assure the audience that there were plenty of women involved in tech um, in, in different capacities from founders to um, you know all all the zillions of roles you can you can undertake in tech so you know I would have really liked to to hear from some women, female-led companies on what what their perspectives were of the um, the the tech scene over there and um, how they were navigating it and all those sorts of things because it is also a very traditional Catholic country so that I would have been interested to see if people were working in the women's health space or access to reproductive rights or any of those sorts of things. Okay, I, I must admit I jumped out of the event slightly early, yeah. so I missed this entire conversation. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I guess I guess the the female representation was sort of what I'd expect from. Well, though actually, this is actually interesting because, um, like for example, when I was in Albania, the female representation there was very high, so it's not consistent with these kind of ex Eastern Bloc countries, but. Um, yeah, that's what I thought too because I yeah. know that's what you, you've said previously yeah. and I've had other people say the same. So um, hence I would have been interested to, to hear some of those voices represented. Okay. And then finally in that crazy week, these are all events we went to in one week and I went personally to some other events as well. It was a very, very busy week. Mm. We went to Startup Night. Now Berlin loves doing these long nights of where you it usually starts around 5 p.m. And the event can sometimes finish about 3 a.m., various themes. Uh, and this one was startups, uh, four venues spread around Mitte, sort of each around a particular-ish theme. Um, and I must admit it seemed less advertised than last year, but it was still pretty busy. Mm, we weren't mm. there. We didn't say that late, but it, it was still pretty busy. I think they um, also had a pitching competition. They, they did, definitely. Mm. Do you want me to just uh, run through some of the companies we met or do you have any particular feelings you want to start with? Um, I mean, just some general comments, I guess. I mean, blockchain and, and, and bitcoins were very strongly represented in the kind of fintech space. There was a lot of people, or at least two or three that we spoke to, that were trying to disrupt some of the traditional banking and the traditional accountancy or, you know, financial management services. Um, there was people working in the smart car space um we spoke to them more at the end of the night so we didn't really spend as much time perhaps in the, in that space um all, all the transport space as well um yeah look it was an interesting night the first one of the first interesting ones we met which hopefully will be an interview in the future was a company called gestalt robotics they don't actually make robots but they make software for robots and this i found interesting because mm. i would just love to know like how do you make software for robots? Uh, what platforms do you work in? How do you do it? How do you start? How? Yeah. So I hope we hope to do an interview with them in the near future because I'm fascinated to know exactly what that sort of process is. Um, we also I can sort of jump around a little bit here. There was actually some quite cool music applications. I think uh, there was. One that taught you how to play guitar, which worked quite nicely. As an ex-professional guitar player, it was worked pretty well, in my opinion. 
Um, there was also a company who I've met before, but it was nice to see that they finally um, finished. And actually, I'm struggling to find their card right now. I can't remember the name of the company, but I will add it to the show notes when I find it. Mm. It's like a programmable effects box. Oh, that's right. But the right. most interesting one was one of the ones we tried earlier, a company called Mellow Drive. It's only available on iPads, but it was like a collaborative music application. But no one really has to know music. You just kind of get a feeling and you you move your hand around if you want to make it faster or slower or different instruments and things. And it was kind of, it was quite fun, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I've seen a few things in this kind of oh, space in, in Berlin bubble. before. I mean, we have a, <laughs> no, no, not the same, but there is certainly an interest in Berlin in um, music tech. And there is even a, um, a co-working space mm, that mm. Is, is dedicated to that. Um, that's pretty well known internationally. Yeah, definitely around the blockchain space and the Internet of Things space, we met quite a few companies doing sort of logistics tracking, asset yeah. tracking, IoT, security and providence. I mean, I guess it's a new space, but we've both met lots of companies that do this. So I don't know how original it is now, I guess. Yeah, it's 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 actually a good point. I often wonder with um with new technology, you 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 don't only get kind of the new products, you get all the peripheral services and um, stewardship and management and all that stuff around them. And I always wonder how far their reach can be. Like you know, it's like my argument with internet with IoT platforms. We've got over probably over five hundred by now since I last wrote about it. Um, do how many do you need? <laughs> Or is it that, you know, each each region or each country can hold their own by having their own localised services for their own market? We're going to jump around a bit uh, on themes here. I guess certain things attract us in Berlin, being the sort of international city it is. One was actually an interesting company called Globals that helped you through chatbot register with city and health insurance and things like that. Do you remember that one, Kate? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously at the moment, depending on the city, it would still just give you a PDF and you'd have to hand it in physically because not every city is wired up for digital submission of these sorts of things. But it was an interesting idea, actually, um, kind of meeting that digital nomad market, mm, I guess. Definitely. Or just the expat market where people may not speak the language fluently. Yeah, yeah. Um, and most of the time when you go to a, a public official office of any sort, they will only speak, of course, they will only speak their, their native language mm, because that's mm. kind of a legal requirement. Mm. At their end. And actually in a similar vein, there was a company that we remembered from last year that uh, have now got a product out called Contest. This will only really appeal to any of you who are freelancers in Germany. Mm. <laughs> so it's a niche market. Uh, but I looked at the stats and Germany is our second biggest audience for this podcast. So there's a few of you out there. And it's basically a bank account and tracking application for freelancers. Yeah. So track your payments, see what's coming in and out, what's owed to you, what you need to cover for bills, things like that. But it's also actually a bank account. Yeah, um, it's a very good idea. Which is quite cool. Uh, we're going to probably get uh, set up with this and test it properly. But just if you're interested in looking at yourself, it's Contest with K-O-N-T-I-S-T. -T. And I'm struggling to remember the company name, Kate, but there was that really interesting um, haptic fabric. Do you remember that one? No, I think I think I we do. Had... I do. They were talking about you. Yeah, I can't remember the name either. No, but I, I think that's what I was referring to when I said we were talking to people with cars because they were talking about using it in connected cars. Yeah, yeah. Actually, this was an aspect we saw a few times. This kind yeah. of feedback for the driver in in vehicles, but also um, do biometrics in cars and things yeah. like that. I'm also imagining it as kind of control surfaces for certain devices and things That's like right. that. But I think they're mainly aiming at the car market at the moment. But, yeah. I mean, it was an interesting event. I think by the end of the week we were so tired. Half the reason we can't remember half the people we spoke to. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I, it I was think a tiring it's the, um, you know, our, a bit of our story when we go to events where – very enthusiastic and we do talk to a lot of people mm, as much mm. as we can but we do get a bit tired and um well, come home forget with who it was lots, of, lots of business cards to go through and lots of yeah. flyers and yeah. kind of have to sit down and 
we really kind of consolidate and plan plan articles and things and talk to our edit- our, our own editors and things like that. So um, here's one more interesting one I'm going to throw in. I didn't speak then. to them because they were busy talking to other people, but I will definitely profile these for D Zone because it suits that audience. Mm. For you, real enterprise developers, this is called ProLeap. And it's a cloud platform that converts your COBOL code to Java code. And anyone who has been a developer for long enough will know how potentially useful that can be. Mm-hmm. And I'll just leave it there. Because <laughs> I'm not sure that makes sense to anybody else. But uh, it was quite <laughs> a cool idea, actually. Anyway, that was that week that was, that crazy week that was. And as you can tell, uh, it was fairly crazy because by the time mm. we got to Friday with Startup Night, we could barely remember what we were talking about anymore. <laughs> um but, yeah, anything else you want to cover, Kate? Anything else you've written, you're going to, you're doing over the next couple of weeks that you want to let people know about? Um, yeah, look, we've both got quite a few things coming up. Um, we will be going to Ukraine for a conference. Um, I'll be popping over to New York for an event there. That Popping over, get a cup of tea, come back. That I, you know, I'm not sure if I can mention on air. <laughs> because a it's significant all, um, company. Under embargo. But, yeah. um yeah, you know, we'll, we'll be floating around and, or as always, writing about issues and looking at things and waiting for, a, you know, some type of mm. either great launch or potential disaster so we can write about it. I am um, my one of my topics to write about today. I've been thinking about overnight is um, AI and has AI, AI gone too far? Um, looking at the idea that. I think it's more, is it, go, is it about to go too far? Yeah. Might be a, and, a and, you question. know, providing, you know, a bit of a thought piece as opposed to, um, you know, a naysaying, oh, no, we do not mm. like AI, AI kind of thing. But also mm. just talking about who controls AI and how much of it is in the hands of a small number of mm. highly intellectual people um, as opposed to your average Joe perhaps on the street. And I think your other disaster, something to do with juice? Oh, yes. Um, Juicero's failure. Um, people would know the Juicero company. They've got an old blender that um, had a sque- effectively a squeeze bag in it and dis- and people discovered after it had been given over $100 million from investors, including Google, as in GB, um, that you could just squeeze the bag and not use the, um, the blender itself. <laughs> and... Um, the company is particularly vilified at the moment because not only that whole underpinning thing of why people were funding it in the first place is worth mm. pulling apart, and I've written about that, but mm. the um, the founder and CEO was found partying at Burning Man while his company was going under. Burning. <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, what's, yeah. what's that expression about, you know, the person playing the fiddle? When Rome burns, uh, Nero played fiddle whilst Rome burns. Yeah, must literally, be must burning. Yeah, which apparently is a myth, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> As he's always. Yeah, so, um, you know. Yeah. It's, and, um, and from me, apart from uh, EFA articles, I actually seem to, looking back through my thread, I have written about nothing but blockchain the past couple of weeks. Mm. Uh, an article I've been working on for a little while finally got published how blockchain will disrupt traditional computing. Great. is out on Tech Beacon. And also the start of my regular column for DZone, Block Watch, talking about just miscellaneous blockchain news. And also just published last night was um, my article for CodeShip about um, does GraphQL reduce the need for documentation? Uh, Somewhat developer topic there. If any of those words mean anything to you, then go and have a look on CodeShip. Any events for the next few weeks? Um, Yes, we are at IT Arena in Ukraine next week, so September 29th onwards. And then just in case we don't get to a podcast before then um we are both at sort of vox days in belgrade on october the 19th and then i will be at ChangeCon in zagreb pretty much the day after on october 21st and yeah kate might be in the north of north america at some point in the near future and when she can tell you about it she will i will <laughs> so, um, but i can't <laughs> but yeah if you're around the ukraine then sorry i got that completely wrong i made the the rookie mistake if you're around Ukraine, there is no there, um, then let us know. We're going to be in uh, a couple of cities, actually. Um, and we look forward to to hearing you. So uh, also coming up on the podcast feed soon is an interview with Canonical about Ubuntu Core and their whole Snaps uh, application system. And also uh, an interview with someone from OpenStack. So two very kind of developer-friendly interviews coming up 
in the podcast feed very soon. And uh, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this little roundup of our crazy week in Berlin. And um, if you enjoy what we do, then please go to gregoriusmammal.com slash podcast for previous show notes or to slash support to buy merchandise, make a donation through any cryptocurrency you like or even good old-fashioned PayPal. Um, Kate, let the people know how they can stay in touch with you. Um, well, my contact details are actually on my Twitter page. My Twitter page or my Twitter handle, I should say, is at Kate Lawrence. That's Kate with a C underscore and then Lawrence with a W. And you've also got katelawrence.com, of course. I have, but it needs a little bit of updating. <laughs> well, there you go. And as they always say, the architect's house, the dentist's teeth, blah, blah, blah. And you can keep in touch with me on Twitter at 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 <laughs> <laughs> at Chris Chinch or com, And we will talk to you again soon. Take care, everybody. <laughs>